look into the future, opportunities and risks in crypto. Boy, that is not a hot topic. Um, Connor Platt, CEO, Confluence Capital. I'm going to turn it over to you, and then uh, you can uh, introduce your panel. Well, yours. Uh, I, do you want to use? I think she's going to need that, and you can use that. Okay. Great. Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, excited to. Uh, to get on with this panel, I guess everyone knows today's an interesting day in crypto land. Bitcoin went over 90,000. Um, and a lot has happened in 2024 for the crypto ETFs. And this panel is going to guide us through what's happened, where it's going, and some of the lessons learned of the products. So with that, I think there's five folks on the panel. If you do a quick introduction, your name, your firm, and then we'll get into a recap of 2024. Hi, I'm Kristen Mearswell. I'm the head of digital assets for FTSE Russell. We're a London stock exchange company. Uh, Ophelia Snyder, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of 21 Shares. Uh, we offer cryptocurrency, ETFs and ETPs uh, in the US and in Europe. Hi, Krista Lynch. I'm a VP at Grayscale where I lead ETF capital markets. Grayscale is a leading digital asset asset manager. I'm Chris Gennady, Global Head of Research at Wisdom Tree. We have crypto products in the US and in Europe. Uh, my name is Thomas DeFazio. I'm at uh, Roundhill Investments, an innovative ETF provider. And uh, we uh, have two crypto ETFs that use uh, crypto uh, covered call strategies. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, it's been quite a year for, for crypto ETFs in 2024, the introduction of the Bitcoin ETF and then the Ethereum ETFs. And I guess uh, maybe we start with, with Krista on the, on the adoption rates and just kind of your take on 2024. Yeah, what an exciting year it's been. Uh, January was when we saw the first Bitcoin ETPs come to market. It feels like this week is kind of the cherry on top for Bitcoin prices. I checked like every hour today and it's <laughs> gone up to a new record. So I don't even know where it's at right now, but we've had a ton of price action and a ton of new all-time highs in the past few weeks as a result of the uh, election results. But going back to the spot Bitcoin ETPs, some stats on how successful they've been. So right now they're at about $90 billion in AUM. And to put that in perspective, gold ETPs, which have been around for over a decade, are at about 100. So these Bitcoin products have been able to do the work of what some other commodities funds have done in a decade. Um, so I think that that speaks to the adoption and the need for an ETP. A lot of investors were kind of sitting on the sidelines, unable to get over the hurdles, like having to open a wallet or do other things like that to get Bitcoin exposure. Um, and I think just the last thing that I would add is this has been like 10 years in the making. So uh, Grayscale sued the SEC about two years ago to bring these products to market. And I know several of us on this panel have had products available to the public well before this year to get that exposure. Excellent. Uh, Chris, do you want to give your take on uh, crypto in 2024? Yeah, so um, for, first of all, I think we have to thank uh, the election results because as we sit here, uh, a lot of the price action that we see, you never know exactly why, but you would surmise that statements like uh, a reserve for the government, uh, that's playing a role. Statements like certain uh, names being floated for a possible SEC chair shift. Uh, that, that's an element. Um, the, the idea of just less regulation, more financial innovation, uh, and that being more a focus going forward uh, is playing a role. And, and at Wisdom Tree, it's been interesting to kind of straddle the Atlantic Ocean, um, where on one side, since say 2018, 2019, you've had what we call in the US spot Bitcoin, you, you've had it. It's just been fully available for going on five, six years now. Uh, and it, you, usually the US market leads, the US market is bigger. Um, now it is already bigger because as the numbers that were already presented uh, vastly um, outpace uh, everything that's happened in Europe so far. But um, in Europe, a big thing and something I'm looking forward to possibly seeing this year, you never know. Uh, but in Europe, you can do staking, meaning these coins, uh, in some cases, emit a yield. 
uh, and investors love yield. We, we see all sorts of options-based funds and everything uh, focused on yield. Uh, if you can get yield off of certain uh, crypto assets like Ether, uh, that becomes a lot more interesting. But so far um, in the US market, we, we haven't necessarily cracked the code uh, at least fully on things like that, whereas in Europe uh, we have across the board. So it, it'll be interesting to see if we can start getting some of those developments through. Great. Uh, Ophelia, you have a lot of experience running products in Europe, and I think it would be informative for the audience to kind of get your take on lessons learned there and then what's coming with this with, with the US markets. So I think staking is probably a good place to start. Um, 21 Shares runs the largest staked products in Europe. Um, we run the largest Ethereum product in Europe. We run uh, an incredibly large Solana product, which is actually bigger than the Ethereum products in Europe and bigger than most of the Bitcoin products in Europe as well. Um, all of them having staked assets in them. So I think I, I agree. I think that's certainly one of the directions of travel um, and something that the US regulators have been very firm on. Um, and it just, that comes down to honestly infrastructure and, and how uh, infrastructure for issuers has been built out, I think is gonna be a big part of what predictors for success and proliferation look like beyond the, uh, beyond the obvious sort of regulatory hurdles. The European market is quite different. So 21 shares makes up about 40% of the AUM in Europe for crypto exchange traded products. Um, and we're running the like third most asset gathering Bitcoin product in the US today. Um, and it's been really fascinating because it's actually identical. It's a very, very similar adoption curve. I think the when you look at the US market, the US market is the largest capital market in the world. So obviously this is happening at a larger scale. But fundamentally, what we saw in the European market is you start to see people come into Bitcoin, they start to learn something about digital assets, they start to understand how it's gonna interact in their portfolio, maybe they allocate a tiny bit, then they build out broader allocations there. Once they're comfortable with that, they start to explore alts, start to see people begin to allocate to Ethereum. Once they understand sort of smart contracts and, and the value of that technology, that's typically when you start to see that longer tail in products like Solana or index products become particularly interesting. And we've had clients in the European market come to us asking like, what is a blockchain? And actually complete their journey all the way through to, can you, you know, give me a comparative analysis on different metaverse platforms or different smart contracts platforms? Or you know, how do you really use DeFi? Like I wanna start having my fund potentially do that directly. And it's been really interesting. I think we're gonna see something extremely similar in the US in terms of what that education curve looks like and fundamentally in terms of what that adoption curve looks like. I think the biggest difference is there's the size of these markets is just very different. And I think that's going to fundamentally change the way crypto crypto markets work today. Kristen, I know you wanted to talk a bit about the liquidity measures within the crypto markets. And I know this audience would be interested in that. So. Yeah, if there's one kind of myth buster I want you guys to all walk away with is that crypto markets are extremely liquid. Um, a lot of people say to me, like, how do I make an index out of crypto assets when only Bitcoin and maybe Ethereum are liquid enough? Um, so just to give you guys some stats, I'm going to see if I can do it without looking at my paper. Um, we, we run the Russell 2000 at FTSE Russell, and we run a FTSE Digi 50 index. So it's just a top 50 digital asset index. The largest or the most liquid asset in the Russell 2000 for the month of October um, trades for 740 million a day. Bitcoin in the month of October was trading 9.9 .9 billion in a day. So I think we know Bitcoin's really <clears throat> very quite liquid, but this is what interests me. There's 405 names in the Russell 2000 that trade less than the least liquid asset in the FTSE Digi 50. That name is um, Balancer. It's an automatic market maker. So anyway, it's just, it's just incredible how liquid it is. So just remember, it's a very liquid market compared to the Russell 2 even, which is an index we all know and love. Shout out to Balancer. I, I, <laughs> I actually know, I know some folks there, so that's, that's great. Um, so before we open this up to audi the audience questions, I think one of the the things that Thomas, we're gonna leave with you, of sort of framing for the audience and investors, it's not too late, this is really the beginning. So maybe if you could lead that off and then everybody take a take and then we'll open up for questions. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Um, 
So I, I do want to just tug at a thread that Kristen also had just mentioned. Um, something that we're also really excited about here at Round Hill is the uh, recent approval from the SEC to now, now start listing options on Bitcoin exchange traded products. That's very powerful for just increasing the adoption of the asset, which also enhances liquidity, increases accessibility. Um, and now, when you think about how the accessibility and adoption of this asset has broadened, it's just, it really shows how much we still have to learn. Um, when I first was encountering Bitcoin, it's, it's now a 15-year-old asset, but yet it's still, there's still so much to learn. I thought of it predominantly as a way to speculate, a high beta, way to implement high beta in your portfolio and, and do a little bit of risk taking. But um, now at Roundhill, uh, we've learned that there's a whole nother way in which you can deploy more sophisticated strategies. Um, and all the panelists here are working on implementing those innovative strategies as the environment uh, becomes more support of the asset class. Um, and so what Roundhill does is we do monthly covered call strategies on Bitcoin and Ether. And that enables us to really just open up the asset class for people that may be worried about the overall volatility aspect. Um, and you get some yield along the way. Um, as we've been seeing just in 2024, it's an incredibly volatile asset class. And with that, uh, you can actually get a pretty good, you can get end up getting a pretty good yield for it. And also opening up the accessibility to the broader investment uh, group. Got it. Chris, do you want to frame uh, crypto for investors? for 2025? Yeah, so your question, it's not too late for 2025. One point that I would make there is we're just starting to see some institutions adopting the ETP format of Bitcoin and other digital assets. Um, Emory just recently disclosed that they're the first endowment to invest in a Bitcoin ETP. They bought the Grayscale Bitcoin Mini Trust. Uh, and if it's not too late for them, it's not too late for you. So should we open it up for questions? Back there. Of cryptos out there, right? So we can see this market has a lot of, um, thanks to the election, there's been a lot of movement and you know, store wealth and so forth. But in terms of adoption, going out and buying a burger at the New York Athletic Club, um, have you seen much of that? Or where do you see the potential for the most immediate growth in terms of adoption of using cryptocurrency? Yeah, I think a, pe a lot of people love to ask the question, can I buy my coffee with Bitcoin? And I think that is a relevant question in many other countries that don't have as stable of a currency. I certainly encourage you guys to jump in seeing things in other jurisdictions. I think in the US, the biggest use case is the store of value. And I think Bitcoin in the US is also kind of this lightning rod, if you will, for all things digital asset, web, three, AI. I think when people think I want to get involved in any of the above, they typically gravitate to Bitcoin to express that. And that's one of the reasons that we've seen a lot of investment in Bitcoin ETPs. But I certainly encourage you guys to answer as well with what you're seeing. Um, sure. So look, I, I think my, my perspective is a little bit different. Um, when we think about adoption of assets like Bitcoin, I think one of the themes that comes up very frequently is this concept of like a hedge against inflation and how it's behaved through this more inflationary period. I think. One of the really interesting data points that I look at as we look at what is the real use case here and what are people using this for? And um, I think the, the direction of travel on Bitcoin has certainly been towards store of value more than necessarily for payments processing. Um, and that has a lot to do with, quite frankly, like the way the technology is set up. But when you think about the fact that there's act there was actually a very strong inverse correlation between regional bank stocks and Bitcoin during the regional bank crisis, there's a reason for that. People are using these products as a way of hedging their exposure to potentially unstable infrastructure. And that's happening, it happened in the US when we were looking at a US regional bank crisis. It happens globally when you look at currency related issues. So I think it's definitely growing in um, use as, a, as that sort of store of value component. 
in the way in which people are managing their sort of intrinsic systemic risk. And I think there's certainly more of that outside of the US, but we've even seen a couple of somewhat small examples of that happening here. We have fewer issues with our currency, so I agree you're gonna see less of it, but you can even see that pattern reflected here to some degree. The, when you start to think about payments and other pieces of infrastructure, you're probably looking more at smart contracts and that's where you're gonna see like utilization rates and things like, and smart contracts calls and things like Ethereum or Solana, which are growing immensely in terms of actual user base. Um, one of my favorite things that's happened in crypto in the last maybe year or so is there's been this really marked shift away from blockchain for the sake of deploying a blockchain to leading with use case. So like one of the examples of this most people probably are not aware of is that PlayStation has decided they're going to actually use NFTs to create assets within their games that different developers can work on. They're going to be running that market and it's actually going to be embedded into their PlayStation platform. It's really interesting. No one really talks about that as an NFT use case. That's just the next iteration of PlayStation's development stack and how they're gonna make video games better and more interesting and assets within video games more portable across different games. And everyone's kids are probably gonna be super excited about interacting with that in some way. Mm -hmm. So like maybe the tens of thousands of dollars people are spending on Roblox when Roblox isn't cool is not gonna be thrown in the garbage. That'd be great. But, that, but what's interesting is that PlayStation isn't leading with the fact that it's an NFT or that it's being built on a blockchain. It's leading with, hey, this is gonna make for a better video game experience for our customers. And I think that's one of the most interesting shifts. And that's happening in financial services, it's happening in like video games, it's happening in, um, quite frankly, like a few other places as well, you're starting to see that where those real use cases are driving the use of smart contracts, they're driving the use of these platforms, and publicly they're being driven by real users and real use cases, not just we're putting it on a blockchain because we can, which I think was a lot of the problem with the last bull market. More questions? Anyone, anyone? In the back? Hard to see with the light, but. Hi, my name is Ayush. With crypto options getting, uh, like, once they get liquid enough, do you, do you see crypto defined outcome ETFs coming soon? Who wants to take that? Um, it, it's. It's, I think that certainly could be along the pipelines of product innovation. Um, from, from, what I've, from what I've read about it, um, right now the exchanges are starting very conservatively with the contract sizes that are going to be permitted for options on these, on these types of products. So I think it's a little bit of a, of a trust building process going forward. But as, as the barriers to entry come down, I think that ultimately will just be an overall positive for, for the overall industry. It goes to something I think Krista was saying around adoption. It's really early from an adoption perspective, also in terms of how sophisticated of strategies you're seeing adoption in, right? Like defined outcome ETFs are, are fantastic and I know they're certainly very popular. They are less popular than the S&P 500 and they were certainly less popular than the S&P 500 when the S&P 500 started being a real thing. So realizing that like that product innovation, there's, a, there's an adoption curve here. And right now, most of the time, in my experience, you're still talking about what is Bitcoin? How is that gonna help in my portfolio before you start creating increasingly sophisticated overlays? I think there's gonna be a, some time before the market adoption for that is there um, in a really concrete way. I think we're just, this is just the beginning. I think we'll certainly see it over time. But again, if you look at other markets that are a little bit more developed for guidance on what that looks like, there's a pretty there's a pretty big gap between when people start allocating to Bitcoin and when they start really diversifying um, those portfolios, and it's time based. Do you want Do you want to add to that? Yeah, you can tell. I'm like, hey, um, when when we were um, all talking earlier, we were chatting a little bit about memes and you know lessons learned. I just want to go back to that. Is if if you don't know what a meme, it's a token that many people would say has no intrinsic value, but something that I think we've all learned is maybe investment professionals would say there's no intrinsic value, but people are trading them and they're having a ton of fun with these with these assets. So it's a part of the market we can't ignore, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily appropriate to go into a product or investable product that we'd be offering as financial professionals. 
But um, just want to share one thing and then see what you guys want to say about this. But <clears throat> in the last month, AI has actually created, or they've been putting memes in their own secure wallet so you can airdrop them into the wallet of an AI agent. And then these agents act like influencers and pump up the price of a meme token. And things are happening in this space so quickly that some of these memes are worth over a billion dollars. Again, intrinsic value is not in question here, but it's just something that's happening. So do you guys want to talk about memes and what you think of them? <laughs> uh, I, I have, we, use, we have a very defined firm view on memes. Um, we run a lot of product. And I think that's one of the things people are often surprised by when they start looking at 21 shares. We run 53 funds all over the world. And they cover about 40 different underlying assets. Going back to the whole point, this stuff is really liquid. Um, most notably, we have never launched a meme token product because I we have a very fundamentals-based approach. And if our research team can't substantiate that this project is real, has a reason to exist, and the valuation is based on something, we're not going to launch product there. And a big part of what our clients rely on us for is the ability and willingness to screen for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the AI, the intersection of AI and blockchain is fascinating and I think is going to be one of the major drivers for adoption um, to like massively simplify it. How do you, how does a computer and a human being bind a contract between the two of them to issue a mortgage? Right, like doing these transactions in an on-chain environment makes that really easy and giving AI agents the ability to actually control financial assets in some way and be able to deploy them and bind contracts is incredibly convenient for what we expect AI to do in financial services, in people's lives as assistants, and just quite frankly, generally. So I think there's gonna be a very significant tie in there. I really hope it's not entirely related to meme coins. <laughs> Any other questions? Please. Hello guys, uh, first question. Now we have Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF. What do you think, what is gonna be the next steps? Another cryptos, another memes, we'll see. Chris, do you wanna take a shot first and then? Well, I mean, uh, look, um, what we were just talking about, it uh, almost feels like uh, you know the fun of gambling, which, which we all know is there. So I'm gonna put my chips on the table and say uh, Solana is a very interesting product. And if, let's say, the SEC were to base things on approving because of usefulness and use case and technology, uh, I think Solana should be near the top of the list as a possible next uh, approval. But that's admittedly me speculating because we don't even know who the chair is going to be at this stage. Yeah, I think there's no clear precedent like there was to get to Ethereum from Bitcoin, which was heavily dependent on the presence of surveilled futures. So people have filed for various things. I think a lot of us have filings out there. Grayscale recently filed for a multi-token fund, which is another one of the avenues some are taking. Uh, we actually ported over a rule that we borrowed from traditional finance where diversified 40 act funds can have a certain percentage of liquid assets, up to 15%. We kind of translated that into a crypto version where we suggested that up to 10% of assets in the fund could be unsurveilled markets. Uh, and the fund does contain XRP and Solana, which are two single token products that have been filed for. So hopefully we can propel all of the agendas forward with this product. Anyone else take a shot? I would say Solana. Um, we run a $1 1.2, $1.3 billion Solana fund in Europe. It stakes, it's phenomenally successful. Our clients have made an enormous amount of money trading those products. Um, it's been a fascinating journey, quite frankly, as a platform. Um, I agree on the utility points. I agree on the suitability points of like, this is a real thing that has a place in portfolios. We've seen firsthand that it operates flawlessly and it has for years. So there's no real concerns operationally around these products. Um, I agree it's going to come down to whether or not we are establishing as a precedent in the United States that you must have a futures market prior to having a spot market for commodity products in fund wrappers. And I think that is a outstanding question that's going to come up, I think, in the, let's call it, next iteration of the SEC under the new administration. 
but I think that is at the crux of almost every one of these filings, is wh which side of that are we breaking on? Um, just wanted to add on the Solana um, path here. We cover 400 assets at FTSE Russell, and we've been noticing a lot of network activity where some of these smaller protocols are moving from the Ethereum blockchain over to Solana. And it, it, when I say a lot, it's not like one or two, you know, so it's kind of like happening all the time. Um, so I think that's a, a leading indicator that the crypto community is embracing the Solana blockchain. And maybe for people who don't don't know what that would mean, it, it's basically the equivalent of imagine an app developer deciding from going from I'm only going to work with Android to I'm either going to work with both Android and Apple or I'm actually only going to work with Apple. That's how to think about this, just bringing it to maybe something people are more familiar with. Any more questions? I got one and one here. It will be a positive question, even, even though I will uh, don't uh, sound so positive. Look, I have zero bitcoins, zero crypto myself. Uh, at the same time, I'm from uh, I'm from Slovakia. It used to be a communist country 30 years ago. Uh, during my life, I'm 34. I already had four different currencies at home, so now it's euro. Mm -hmm. uh, euro itself is 20 years old. 25, I guess, something like this. So if, if Euro is going to be here in 20 years, nobody knows. So I'm actually like, you know, positively looking for something, let's call it more stable. Uh, but my main question is, uh, to the point, uh, if I buy, let's say, Bitcoin, do I buy a new kind of cash or do I invest or maybe both? Who wants, who wants to take that? Can help me maybe. I think it depends how you buy it. Um, so if you buy it in the ETP wrapper, then you are buying it, I would say, to invest. However, it is an investment in something that can probably in future be used for payments and have other utility, like what we touched on before. Um, but that would require you to effectively unwrap it and have it in the spot form. Now, there are many different ways that you can invest in it. You can get access to Bitcoin through futures, options, uh, the ETP, you can buy it outright. So I think it really just comes down to what your interest is and what uh, investment strategy you're going for in investing in it. And I would maybe add one thing. So again, this is relatively new stuff in the US, right? The, the track record of these products in the US is like 10 months. The track record of these, we launched the world's first spot physically backed crypto product in Europe in 2018. Like we've, we've been doing this for ages. Um, one of the things that we've seen with clients is because of exactly what you're talking about, we have clients who use ETBs or ETFs for their long-term holdings. In the same way like people might think about a money market fund or some kind of savings account with some kind of interest rate on it for their long-term fiat positions, right? It's sitting there, it's definitely stored, it's definitely safe, I'm not gonna worry about this. They then also buy things on centralized exchanges, which is more like fast trading. So like think about the difference between your 401k and your interactive broker's trading account. And then you also see people who are actually then holding actual wallets where they're doing things on chain, which is gonna be much closer to your checking account. And you actually see as people grow in sophistication that they have all of the above. And I think that's likely the direction of travel. In certain countries, I do think you will see the use of this in a more cash-like format. I think it's more likely than not, and this is like a sophisticated point, but I think it's more likely than not that it's either going to be some form of wrapped Bitcoin that exists on another network that operates a little bit differently, which is more suited for payments, or it'll be some kind of stable coin that's linked to something else. Could be gold, could be the dollar, could be something else that you're using for that higher velocity payment structure, right? Things that look a little bit more like Visa. Visa doesn't actually have dollars in it, right? It's private money that's essentially synthetically created within a network. That will continue to happen. And I think you're going to see applications that look a lot like Visa for payments and disbursements on other chains potentially denominated in Bitcoin. That's kind of a subtle point. So I think what the, the short answer is you're, you can use it for all of the above in the exact same way people use the dollar or gold bars, which is uh, there are people all over the world who stockpile dollars as a form of long-term savings plan and a hedge against whatever's happening domestically with their currency. I don't think there's any real difference here. Um, and I know it's a, potentially not a satisfying answer because there's a lot of nuance to it, but I think it, the answer is it depends on what it is you're trying to do and it's a very important part in managing a healthy exposure to the asset and quite frankly, like a you know healthy approach to like personal financial hygiene to sort of have all of these different pieces working for you long-term. 
I have one. So uh, obviously I know people have varying levels of risk tolerance, but are there any trends that you guys are seeing in terms of where clients are putting this into portfolio percentage wise, like new adopters who are new to the space, what percentage of their portfolio are they looking to allocate to a Bitcoin or crypto ETF? What, what we are seeing uh, from many is somewhere in the region of 1% on the lower end, uh, 5% on the higher end. Uh, it's an interesting exercise to sort of look back because as other panelists have indicated, it's not the oldest asset class uh, out there. I think the Satoshi white paper was say 2008, 2009, and before that this didn't exist. And you look at some of the returns, usually Bitcoin's return, like if you put it on one of those charts with all the colors, stocks, bonds, commodities, all the different things, usually in many years, Bitcoin is either at the very, very top, outperforming everything else by a huge margin, or it's at the very, very bottom, underperforming everything else by a huge margin. So you understand there's a huge level of volatility, but it's also exhibited an interesting lack of correlation from time to time to the main asset classes, which has given at those one to 5% levels an interesting portfolio outcome where the overall portfolio has been in a better position, even if uh, you, know, you look at the individual asset, it's almost 80% annualized volatility and uh, the drawdowns that you've seen in the last 10 years have approached 80% from time to time. Um, just to piggyback off of uh, what Chris was mentioning, so Round Hill has a, has a very uh, awesome consumer base, and we also engage a lot with retail clients. And from the retail perspective, we've learned uh, through our fund offerings that there's also a very strong appetite for yield. Um, we've seen that in some of our zero DTE covered call option equity strategies. But we are also seeing that within the uh, the crypto space. There's there's demand for uh, managing the volatility that Chris has alluded to within a retail portfolio. Um, and ultimately, uh, a lot of investors are saying uh, they've come to us and they've asked, "What's the right balance here?" And it really does come down to what is your risk tolerance and what can you stomach? Can can you sleep at night? And is that actually appropriate for? your investment goals. And that's never something that we can give a cookie cutter answer for. Um, but I also just think that the broader investment base and, and why I think volatility dampening uh, ETF strategies for crypto are becoming more uh, popular is because of this morning, uh, similar to uh, what Krista was alluding to, I was, I was my eyes were glued to the Bloomberg because when you see that Bitcoin's price is trading 42% above its 200-day moving average, it, it makes you shy away because that is some crazy volatility. But then when you look back historically, and this is part of it being a nascent asset class, 42% is not even remotely extreme to what it's done over the past decade. And so I think investors are trying to really grapple with this newfound asset and what is hard to control volatility, and then what's the right answer for how that fits in a portfolio? And I think we're still learning every day what that right answer is. And one thing goes without saying, you can't have a 20 vol product that is expected to do 100% returns in a year. Mathematically, those things are not possible, right? So there is a relationship here, both on the upside and on the down around these products. I think the one other thing I would highlight here is that when you think about portfolio allocations and portfolio construction, we see something similar. That one to 5% range is where most people shake out. I think the, the really interesting element here is that as you look at the customer base and they start building these positions, it's, it's typically a slow process to build. Most people aren't at the one or 5% yet, even if that's their target. They're still built, sell, buying into this over time. And when you see trading activity like today, it can be quite, you know, like quite, quite shocking to see in the market. But I think at least in this specific case, we're likely only at the beginning of a bull run, um, simply because it's entirely based on a combination of ETF flows, which are continuing and accelerating, and seem to be quite sticky even in drawdowns. And we've seen that over the past 10 months and over the past couple of years, that like you don't see that much bleed from these products. It's typically people who have a long-term holding pattern. And also the fundamentals that people are excited about is US regulatory, expectation of US regulatory clarity. It's the expectation, not the implementation. The administration hasn't even come into power yet. Like 
they're just starting with appointments. We need to wait and see here because it's completely conceivable that you get a very crypto friendly new head of the SEC or a very crypto friendly new um, setup between regulations between the SEC and the CFTC and you're going to see these fundamentals likely bear out positively. The administration, the incoming administration has made it very clear they're pro crypto. The degree of that is what people are unsure about. They're just going off of it's not negative. It's not unbanking crypto companies and it's not you know, you need to sue somebody just to be able to get your prospectus looked at. We're now moving towards a world that is at least nominally going to be a little bit more transparent, right? Moving away from regulation by enforcement. These are real fundamental shifts. So going back to the question about is it too soon? Probably, like, th this is not fully, there's no way this is priced in. This is just the expectation that it's going to be better than unbankings, lack of regulatory clarity, regulation by enforcement, and having to sue somebody to get them to look at your prospectus. The bar is really low here uh, in terms of what the expectation is. If, if the expectation is just better than that, it would be hard for it to be worse, and there are fundamentals that are impacting this price movement. Any other questions while we have our panel? Mine is around taxation. Um, can you give us what you think might happen in the coming years. I know that Europe is taxing Bitcoin and I think Italy was gonna, looking to raise the taxation, but I think maybe it's not going through. But does any uh, lobbying occur behind the scenes to get these things done? Uh, how much is the Federal Reserve Bank involved with the decision-making process? Can you give us any kind of transparency? So, so we had hundreds of millions of dollars funding various election campaigns from crypto related sources, uh, you know, just, just happened. So, you know, first of all, like, like the other panelists have been alluding to, you got to see the appointments, you got to see the announcements. It's nice to hear that President Trump prefers possibly no taxes uh, because we don't pay taxes on US dollars. So why should we pay taxes on Bitcoin? I, I don't know if he'll be able to make that happen, but like it, it's nice, nice thing uh, to hear. You've got this sort of fundamental juxtaposition of governments, you, you mentioned Italy, the United States, all these different governments really don't have enough money. Like that's why we talk about deficits, budget deficits, and they need to raise revenue somehow. Now, Pre President Trump, if you take him at his word, he's gonna use tariffs to get that done. Whether or not that's successful will, will remain to be seen. How that gets set up will remain to be seen. But you, know, you go to a market like Italy, they probably need even more money. Most markets in Europe have slower economic growth, which means less revenue coming in, in a relative sense, even than the US, which is also at a deficit. So you have deficits around the world. You assume people are gonna have to inflate away their debt. That's one of the reasons why it might be early still to get into things like this, hard assets like Bitcoin. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day here, you're always fundamentally trying to balance the fact governments need money, but people like low taxes, and low taxes tend to get you voted into office as opposed to trying to raise taxes. And specifically on the Italy point, um, they did change their taxation related to crypto assets recently. Um, but Italy is a bit of a special creature, and I think the, the European markets and the European taxation model is a little bit different. They have a tendency to treat different verticals of assets that you hold and the like length of holding in a very different way than we do. Like we have short-term versus long-term capital gains and pretty much everything you do is in some way going to be that aside from certain types of fiat, like FX transactions, pretty much everything falls into the same like overarching model um, and some income related stuff. But honestly, the Europeans have just a very different approach where like for example, uh, certain types of product structuring things can change the way taxation in Germany works holistically, has a lot to do with the way in which redemptions are processed. It, specifically in Italy, yes, they are moving to a different model. I do think these types of taxations are more likely to impact, and there's a lot more sort of arbitrage between the use of an ETB or an ETF versus the holding of physical, especially around the tax rules in Italy. Um, so I do think that's going to continue to be a thing, and I think we'll likely see hopefully more harmonization across Europe in terms of their regulatory infrastructure, especially once you get Mika implemented and you start to see a little bit more pan-European collaboration around digital assets and sort of the next iteration of Mika. I'm hopeful that there will be a little bit more consistency in 
how they are treating this asset from tax perspective. Italy was very, very far ahead in terms of providing tax clarity on digital assets. Um, this is a bit of a reversal of their previous policy, but I, I don't think, I think that's expected as you start to see these use cases evolve, and quite frankly, these governments need more money. Um, I think the tax treatments are more likely going to result in different mix shifts between holding assets directly and physically and holding assets via wrappers or derivative products um, for investors who can choose between these formats. Emphasis on who can, because obviously certain types of fund structures can't. But I think you're, that's more where we've seen play around some of these tax changes in the European markets. More thoughts on taxes? I think one thing I would add on the point about engagement, uh, we love to engage with anyone and everyone who will engage with us. It's not that we're necessarily pushing in one direction or the other, but we feel that there's a big need for education. And so we really just wanna be a resource for regulators as they try to formulate policy. I think one of the biggest deterrents to progress prior to the election was the lack of clarity on things like policy, regulation, and taxes. And so the ability to be more engaged and help just simply educate to inform those policies is a big thing that, that we're very excited about the opportunity to have. Great. Any other questions? I know we're getting closer to drinks, so. Uh, well, while they're thinking of a question, I'll ask you guys a question. First of all, you guys have been brilliant. I, I love this. I'm, I'm learning so much. Um, a couple of questions. You may have already answered this, but just can you give some numbers of who's playing in the space in terms of there's 300,000 advisors in the U.S. alone? Is it 5% of that universe? Is it 50%? Is it, you know, guys trading on their own, just a little bit more on who's playing in the space. That's one and two. In terms of the giants of Wall Street, they're not given the respect that maybe you guys would like to see. Is that changing? And why do you think it maybe has taken so long? If you could shed some light on both of that, but thank you. I, I think the biggest shift I would flag is it used to be completely okay for a CIO's office to have no idea about anything to do with crypto. I think the biggest change I've seen in the last year around who's playing is that that's not an acceptable answer. You can't tell your clients, I have no idea what you're talking about. You can tell them you hate Bitcoin. You think it's the worst thing that's ever been produced and it's gonna kill us all, but you can't say you don't know what you're talking about. And I think that shift, it went from having no opinion was a real option to now being like, okay, you either need to be for lightly for it, lightly against it, hardcore against it, totally fine, but you need to have an opinion. And I think that coupled with the increase in education is really the beginning of engaging the advisor community. Getting off of, I don't know. In terms of percentage? Percentage of the total RA market's tiny, right? I'm, I'm like, Couple single low single digits yeah. would be my guess. The other thing, oh. sure, thank you. Uh, the other thing that I would add on on the percentage point is that a lot of them require a specific number of months for these products to have as a track record, and that's often six months to twelve months. And we're just passing the six month mark. We're we're coming up on twelve really, um, but that is also a major accelerant. I've had a lot of people come up to me at conferences who are in that seat and they're, like Ophelia said, they're kind of like, you know, I buried my head in the sand for many years, but now my clients are asking about this and I need to understand what it is so I can at least answer them. And I think that the momentum is going to continue. Their clients are gonna be asking for it. They can't not know. Uh, and they are coming up on those track record kind of lines in the sand where these will be on platforms and much easier for advisors to put in their clients' portfolios. So something I've, I've noticed, I wasn't sure we engage a lot with uh, the different home offices. So think the home office of Raymond James down in Tampa, the home office of LPL in South Carolina. And it felt like since the ETF was out almost, the message that we were getting across the board, not just any one firm, was if the clients asked for it, so almost like this idea of reverse solicitation, you know, they don't want the clients to like go away. They don't want to not taking money that the client wants to give, but it was very clear they needed the clients to drive the whole discussion. And it's only been recently that I would say, cer certainly less than say 10%, but that's a, a very rough estimate because most home offices still, 
have not sort of reversed that posture. Most home offices still are telling firms like Wisdom Tree, you know, don't necessarily go crazy with the marketing. Like they're they're very reticent on marketing too much or too aggressively. So it's it's been very interesting to watch. You know, an approved product uh, that is out there that people can buy on their own easily. Um, seemingly so far, there is a reticence across the traditional landscape of home offices that we work with on, say, general ETFs broadly. Um, I would just say anecdotally, our conversations with institutional clients regarding even our, our covered call crypto uh, funds has been, has been uh, pretty small to, to count, especially compared to our retail client base. But um, I do say that, like, and this goes back to the adoption curve that Ophelia was talking about earlier. The fact that we are having these conversations, even in the context of uh, the insurance panel earlier, and does crypto have a room, uh, a spot at the table uh, in the concept of insurance and insurance products is an awesome step in the right direction. Um, and I think if you said that to anyone even a year ago, they probably would have laughed at you. <laughs> I mean, we, we have insurance plans in Europe that allocate to our products. That is a thing that has started recently. But we've been in the market for six years now, doing education, doing that type of investor engagement. From what I'm seeing, and I realize you know, I, I see a specific slice of the world, but from what I'm seeing and what 21 Shares is seeing, it's the same adoption curve. You, you, it's retail, it's high net worth, it's family offices, it's self-directed, it is advised clients requesting product, you go from that and sort of the execution only world, you start to slowly chip away. Typically you're gonna start with your private banks or people who are going to do that like ultra high net worth band, the higher echelons of the market. And then you start to see that come down as the advisors feel more comfortable with what that looks like and how it reacts in portfolios and quite frankly get more comfortable with risk and what that risk represents to you know, somebody's pension or somebody's you know, retirement savings. And I think one of the really interesting things we see is you see a lot of like self-directed retirement savings accounts are absolutely buying these types of products. But when you start to get into advised um, environments, you start to get into model-based environments, I think there is this idea of starting with, you know, if, if your client has a billion dollars, they, they can afford to absorb losses, right? And so how do you start to think about that? Um, and how do you bring that sort of level down and build that comfort within a thesis? And I think from what I can see today, I think the US is following a timeline accelerated version of almost exactly the same adoption steps. Um, and I think we'll likely see this start to shift as we get past some of these key milestones, but also quite frankly, as people just have time to put in their portfolios. Like one of the most interesting behaviors I see a lot of, and I'm curious actually if anybody else on the panel sees the same, we see a lot of advisors like in their PA by like 10K. Mm -hmm. They just want a reason to watch it. I'm gonna watch this, see how it does with my portfolio, then I think about my clients. And they put, you know, 10K, maybe 20 in their PAs. And that's how they start thinking about this in the context of their book. And I don't know if you guys have seen the same behavior pattern, but we certainly, both in the US market and abroad, have certainly seen some of that behavior of like, I'm gonna, I, I wanna see what this does first. I don't know if you guys have gotten the same thing. Yeah, in, in Europe, frequently you do a meeting, there could be 11 people in the room. And if the meeting goes well afterwards, you're sitting there, you're like, we know we're not gonna put this in, say, the pension, the insurance fund, the whatever, but five out of the 11 people have it in their personal accounts and they love the presentation. So I, I would agree, that's a, a fairly common uh, occurrence. Uh, I would say similarly. Uh, some will just say, yeah, I bought a couple shares to, so I have a reason to watch it. And it helps me, and I can sleep at night doing that while I learn more about the asset class. I think you also asked um, what's going on with the titans of Wall Street. Um, when we see regulation change in the U.S., you know, a lot of them are U.S. banks. They're not allowed to touch this asset class, but as soon as they're able to, they're going to. And we know that, again, going back to how liquid the asset class is, if they can trade it, they're going to want to do that. Um, so I think we're going to see big changes in 2025 in terms of who's getting into this space and legally able to do so. And there are two pieces of legislation that are, uh, two pieces of rulemaking slash legislation that are holding that up. I would expect the new administration to change some of that posturing. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Right, right, right behind you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
everyone. Um, could you comment on what you think the next level up for education is for sort of the TradFi market? I think TradFi is just starting to get comfortable with Bitcoin and Ethereum now that it's available in a very TradFi wrapper. Um, but there are obviously many, many, many more tokens out there. And one thing that we're doing actually in partnership with FTSE Russell is we have kind of created a taxonomy that will help organize some of the different themes that we see in other tokens to make it more digestible. And this is probably a good one for you to elaborate on. <laughs> I like this one because it has memes in it as well. Um, so one of the sectors is a um, consumer and culture sector. And a lot of the meme tokens are actually built on um, a currency protocol, like the Bitcoin blockchain. They just copy that and create a meme. And so you think, oh, it should go in a currency sector. But the use case of them is really more about having fun and trading with your friends. And you make a bet. And you're like, hey, let's, let's trade Dogecoin instead of US dollars. Um, but it's, it's fun to classify all these things, but in an investable product, meme coins would be screened out. You would just say that's where it sits, but not, not meant to be actually investable. But it helps you understand the different use cases. So we, we just launched actually a product in this category in the European market um, off of sort of our, our own version of this um, that we've developed over the last few years, actually doing sector-based allocations inside of a product. Um, and obviously, you know, token allocations within that, but actually doing a sector-based product. And it's really the first of that type where that is really what's being put forward in um, the sort of exchange-traded product wrapper, um, specifically to kind of help clients navigate what that longer tail looks like and start to think about thematics in this space and different themes and how they intersect at an industry level. So something that's been interesting to watch, it isn't true, we do a lot with artificial intelligence and it's, you, you look at the success of OpenAI and ChatGPT since November of 2022, which is only two years ago. It feels like a lot longer. But you step back and you say, AI itself has been a concept that people have been following, watching, and trying to promote going all the way back to the 1940s and 1950s. But it takes something like ChatGPT, which is just so easy to use, and it almost divorces the need for you to understand AI from just enjoying and getting something out of the uh, particular use case. And I know um, my, my fellow panelists from 21 Shares mentioned the video game idea, this idea that you're seeing things start to get used because they offer a real benefit and looking more at, at cases like that as opposed to looking at it like, oh my gosh, it's this new thing and Oh, it, it's so volatile and I, I don't really know like how to put it in the portfolio. Like it, it'll become a lot simpler, a lot easier once you're just thinking, here's this and I know exactly what it's used for. And in my opinion, the world is better off because of it. Any other questions? Last question. Last Otherwise question. we're gonna wrap it up. We're right on time. Well, you guys were fantastic. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. How about a big round of applause?